And thank you for attending today's webinar on engaging young professionals in this very new environment. My name is Emily Counts and I'm the Community Advancement Coordinator here at ACCE. We are happy to have you on this webinar today led by Andrea Pemberton of the Tulsa Regional Chamber and Rachel Rodney of the Chamber of RVA. They will be presenting on best practices on delivering topical webinars, supporting local organizations, and providing social connections at a time of uncertainty for young professionals. And before I hand it off to our fabulous panel today, I have a few housekeeping items for you. All attendees are in listen-only mode to avoid background noise. At the end of the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions through the chat function. You'll see where I've posted a short chat below. That's where you can ask your questions. Please send all of the questions to me and we will answer them. If we don't get to all the questions, we will get back to you later in the week. You can also share an idea <laughs> with the group through the chat and even share resources and links. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our events division page tomorrow, barring any technical difficulties and our ACCE university page. If you would like to share resources, please feel free to email them to me and I will make sure everyone has them. My email address is emilycount or ecounts at acce.org and I will send that around also. And just as a final reminder, all participants are in are muted today and are in listen only mode for this presentation. Only our presenters and staff will be speaking today. So without further ado, I will introduce our two incredible speakers and I'm so excited that you get to see them today. So today we have Andrea Pemberton. Andrea is the Executive Director of TIPROS, Tulsa's Young Professionals at the Tulsa Regional Chamber. She is passionate about building community, engaging young talent and elevating the voices of young professionals in her city. Previous to her current role, she served as the organization's program manager and spent several years as an educator in Tulsa, Oklahoma and in Jerusalem, Israel. Andrea is a Fulbright research scholar and holds a master's degree in organizational dynamics from the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa. And also we have Rachel Rodney. Rachel is the leadership and engagement program manager at Chamber RVA, Greater Richmond, Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Rachel is, has been at Chamber RVA since February 2020, and she oversees all programs and initiatives for young professionals in the Richmond region. Previously, she worked in higher education, working with college students in career development, residential life, leadership, and fraternity and sorority life. In her free time, which is a lot more now, she rides her mountain bike and works in her yard and loves a good book. She can't wait to be able to go back to being a food tour guide on the weekends because sharing her love of Richmond means sharing her love of Richmond food. I can vouch for that. Richmond has amazing food. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our panel. Thanks, Emily. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We are so excited that there's so many of you that wanted to engage with us today. Um, I'm Rachel Rodney. I'm with Chamber RVA. Um, and as mentioned, I just started in February. So this is quite an adventure um, in my career so far. Um, so today we are going to be talking about how to engage your young professional constituents, especially in the times that we're in right now. So we're going to go into depth on that um, throughout this program. <laughs> awesome. So to give you a little bit of background about um, HYPE and the organization that I work with, HYPE is the Young Professional Network Organization out of Chamber RVA. So HYPE stands for Helping Young Professionals Engage. We have been around since 2007. We are a subscription-based model, um, so people pay a subscription fee, fee per year, or there's also a corporate option, um, and, which gives you access to our events, which is around 24 per year. Um, the way we are structured is if you're a subscriber, you show up to events or you don't, it's up to you. Um, and then we also have a leadership team, which is our volunteer board um, consisting of about 18 people um, who help guide the strategy and programming for the year. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Pemberton. As um, Emily first mentioned, I'm the executive director of TIPROS, which stands for Tulsa's Young Professionals out of the Tulsa Regional Chamber. 
So Typers was founded in 2005. Um, we do not have any formal um, fees or membership dues. So we consider our membership to be very fluid and flexible in that we want to engage as many young people in our city as possible. So throughout the year, um, we'll communicate um, on a weekly basis with about 12,000 people and host anywhere between um, 50, sometimes up to uh, um, 70 or 80 events a year. We are structured by having um, what we call our work crews. So these uh, work crews are focused on passion points that young people in our community really care about. So these crews include arts and entertainment, business development, diversity, government relations, leadership and service, sustainability, and urbanists. And each of these seven work crews have two leaders, which make up the um, core unit of our leadership team, who are the ones who are constantly scheduling um, programming around each of these topics. Um, so we're going to go over what we're going to cover today. So what we're going to talk about is how to engage various audiences, um, how to message and program around current events, um, things to consider when you're planning virtual events, and how to best execute those. What does costing and costs and funding look like? Um, we're also going to give some examples of topics of programs that we've done um, in our organizations, and then finally answer questions or hear ideas from you. Um, I will say, just as a caveat, um, we are by no means experts. We are fumbling through this just like you probably are. Um, we just really wanted to share what has worked for us and um, some ideas that we've had. Um, but you all probably have some really great ideas and we're excited to learn from you too. So to begin, I want to frame this in terms of helping um, you all with your professional organizations, figuring out who is your audience. For some more well-established and professional organizations, this may seem obvious, but especially given the um, challenges that we're facing in our businesses and our communities and um, how young professionals are choosing to work and operate today, um, it might be a good time to pause and reflect on who your different audiences are and cater messaging and programming to the different subsets and different audiences that you might have. So the um, core audience that many of us um, consider is the volunteer leadership team. So these are the ones who are really helping you build out your programming. These are the ones that you're communicating with fairly regularly. Um, but we know that an engaged and activated core volunteer leadership group creates um, a ripple effect that can then go further out. Um, and that can go to your general membership who is who we think of as our traditional audience. These are the people who are showing up to consume the programming that is being created very often by staff and by the volunteer leadership team. Um, and getting feedback and soliciting um, the types of needs that these two different groups have is going to be really, really critical for you to understand how to have an effective YP organization that's engaging young people right now. So beyond this um, core group of individuals and then your general membership, it's also a good time to be reflecting on how you're communicating and engaging your community at large. So um, when we're thinking about the community at large, there's obviously a lot that's happening um, and there's a lot happening nationally um, and globally, but at the hyper local level, this is what you'll want to focus on. Um, by messaging the work that your organization and your young people are doing within the community, that will bolster your reputation. Um, it will frame your organization in terms of a group that is um, engaged, receptive, and um, willing to tackle some challenges that young people in your community are facing right now. Rachel, this is, yeah, this is also a time, I think what we thought about in hype was how can we engage the people we normally haven't been engaging. Um, I think um, we were going through, we are going through strategic planning as a, as a chamber as a whole. So that is an interesting time to be doing that. Um, but I think this was really our opportunity to think about outside our typical audience that we've always engaged with and who can we reach out to more and continue to diversify our perspective to be an organization that truly is for everywhere in the region. So another big part of engaging young professionals right now um, is that it is absolutely critical to address current events. Um, the last thing that any young professional organization wants is to come across as tone deaf and to continue programming as is without being mindful of what's happening again 
nationally, globally, but even at the hyper-local level. Um, so in Tulsa in particular, I'll talk about um, some of the challenges that we've had, of course, um, along with everyone else, COVID-19, um, the dips in the economy, people being laid off and furloughed, and then um, the racial justice and social unrest that we've seen a lot with the Black Lives Matter movement that's happened recently. Um, Tulsa is experiencing all of those things. Um, in addition to that, very recently, I'm not sure if everyone heard in the news, but um, Donald Trump came and had his presidential reelection rally, which was the first one. And uh, Tulsa was kind of the ground zero test site to see if that was going to um, be successful. So that created a lot of additional stressors in our community, not only because the rally was originally scheduled for Juneteenth, which is um, really widely celebrated in um, Tulsa, but it's also coming on the eve um, of us commemorating our 100 year anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. So there was a lot happening in our community around issues issues of racial justice, um, the history of racial violence in our community. Um, and our community has been trying really hard to reconcile with this. So having um, a um, somewhat like divisive leader who's coming into our community um, really um, stoked a lot of controversy. And for several weeks, this was all anyone was talking about. We were worried about the effects um, not only with the um, social tension, but also what this would mean for our community in terms of um, COVID cases rising. So for this period, we basically halted a lot of our programming and we pivoted more towards um, listening, being receptive, um, sending out statements of solidarity within our community. Um, we took the time to send out messages of hope and resilience. We painted murals downtown. Um, we were registering voters and trying to like stay pretty actively engaged in that space. But if we were to continue just our regularly scheduled programming, it would definitely have come across as um, not being um, aware of everything that was happening in our community. So that's just a great example of uh, why you always need to be mindful of what's happening at the local level and to um, address that rather than continuing to um, kind of carry on as, as planned. And I'll send it over to Rachel to talk about some of the um, hyper-local events that were happening in Richmond as well. Yeah, I think just to echo what Andrew is saying, um, really this has shown um, these things don't happen in a vacuum and they really do impact our well-beings, our professional lives, our personal lives. And that is so interconnected, especially um, I think Gen, Gen Z and millennials, um, which are kind of in our age range of young professionals, are really thinking about how their personal values impact their professional lives. So um, to move forward without rearranging programming, without um, addressing what's going on head on, would be very tone deaf and um, I think a poor decision. So, but with that said, we wanted to step back and be really conscious of who we are as an organization before we move forward with those types of things. Um, COVID was a little bit easier to navigate, I think, not necessarily knowing exactly what people wanted and how they wanted to engage was, was difficult and still is, um, cause that's ever changing. Um, but I think as far as racial justice and social unrest, we are in Richmond, Virginia. If you've paid attention to any news at all, we, um, have quite a few monuments, um, around Confederate soldiers and Confederate war, um, war figures. So those monuments have been coming down in the last few days. We have about four or five that have come down. Um, and that's been huge. We've had a straight month, um, over a month of protesting every single night. Um, so to act like that wasn't happening, to act like that isn't impacting our community and our, especially I think our younger community, um, what would be you know, ignorant. So um, we did also take a pause and um, put out a statement of solidarity and are using um, this time right now to think about how we're moving forward. And really, like I mentioned, who are we as an organization? What are, what are we here for? So um, if there's one big takeaway that we've kind of had through all of this is that the needs um, and expectations of young professionals have um, shifted pretty dramatically over the last several months um, between the pandemic and everything else that's happening um, across the nation and the globe. Um, determining the needs and expectations of young professionals is critical to helping us determine what type of programming is needed so that we can continue to remain relevant and continue to engage young professionals. So both Typros um, and Hype have um, sent out surveys. So Typros survey uh, went out earlier in the um, 
earlier at the beginning of the pandemic at the beginning of April and ran through the first couple of weeks of May. Um, and we were really just trying to determine how can typers help through the pandemic itself. So as you can see from some of um, the responses that we had, um, the top one was that young people wanted to know um, what opportunities there were for them to give back and to support the community. They also wanted some up-to-date information happening hyperlocally in the city of Tulsa about COVID. Um, but then they also wanted some resources to entertain themselves um, while they were uh, locked up or in quarantine. And then um, they also wanted some uplifting and humorous content, knowing that a lot of what's happening in the news and social media can be very heavy. So they were really seeking some more uplifting content. So using this um, type of information through these surveys, we were able to help um, pivot some of our programming to meet those needs. Um, we were also really mindful to ask our um, members, what level of engagement do you want right now? So um, part of our questions were, are you interested in being 100% um, completely on board and super active in our organization, helping us plan programming and initiatives? Or are you at a zero, which is I'm completely checked out. I'm focusing on myself and my family right now. Please don't bother me. Uh, so we found that we were um, somewhere in between at about 55%, which um, translated to us as, we're excited to consume content. Um, we'll easily take it over sitting on our couches at home. Um, we're maybe not um, in the right state right now, either mentally or financially, to um, really engage um, in ways that we were able to before. So in addition to asking this question, we also collected information. Anyone who had a score of 70 and above, we contacted them um, in individually and asked them, like, you know, what are the ways that we can get you engaged? Um, so that helped us get a read for our membership in general and also helped us activate individuals who are super interested in um, staying engaged during this time. With Hype, our survey, um, we just actually put that out, put this one out last week. Um, so we waited a little bit to let things kind of settle, even though they haven't really settled. Um, <laughs> let things settle a little bit to get some opinions. Um, we really wanted to understand where people were with virtual. Um, this survey was also twofold for us as an organization. As I mentioned, our strategic planning process plays a part in this. So we did ask some questions um, also in addition to some of these about what do you know about hype? What are you looking for in a young professional organization? So we were having some different conversations too. Um, but we did want to know like what elements of a virtual program have been appealing for you? You've probably sat through lots of virtual events at this point. What do you, what do you like? Um, how likely are you to attend an in-person event in the next six months? I think we wanted to get a pulse on that if we are able to do that. Um, will people want to come? Or will you be likely to come to a virtual event? So we've gotten some great responses so far. The, the survey will close next week. So um, I will be happy to share um, those results and questions um, next week. I can send it to Emily, but that's where we're at right now. I'm really excited to get that information. And I will add to that. What I think uh, I've certainly learned from Rachel too is that continuing to survey um, will be helpful, right? This is a great tool and strategy to help you understand where your young professional and membership is at the beginning of the pandemic, in the middle of it, um, trying to get the level of comfortability, especially to ease back into in-person events, which we know there is an appetite for, um, yeah. but a lot of people are still keeping um, health and community safety at top of mind. Um, so helping us try to determine when that, um, when that will begin to happen. And that'll look different depending on your community. To add on to that too, we've, we've created a survey, a quick survey for at the end of every one of our virtual programs, um, just to get an idea of that. So um, we've had good reception from that, but it's just still good to continue to get that information. And so um, with all of that in mind, um, if you haven't already, if you've kind of um, as an organization been trying to figure out best way to engage with virtual or remote events, um, if you haven't found the right platform, um, it's a great time to shop around. <laughs> um, uh, the things to keep in mind are price points. Um, luckily, with um, virtual events, that tends to keep costs down. Um, but also to find the right platform that has the features that you need to host your particular event or meeting. Another thing that we've discovered as we've gone along is the difference between active and passive consumption of um, the programming that we're putting on. So um, for active 
meetings and engagements. This is where you want your members to be um, having discussions, maybe debates, uh, opportunities for them to network face to face. Um, using breakout rooms is a great op um, option for that. Um, really to really just get more messaging out and maybe programming like this uh, but where people can engage via the chat but maybe not having conversations back and forth webinars are a great option um, and depending on um, how you're trying to communicate whether it's just for your membership by itself or your community at large um, pushing things um, like zoom meetings or zoom webinars to facebook live is a great opportunity to have the community understand some of the programming that you host um, and especially if there's, um, if it's fairly low cost for you to host some of these events, if you're not trying to um, make some revenue off of it, um, Facebook Live is a great way to get other people kind of paying attention to the work that you're doing and who might be able to um, join your organization, sponsor it, um, or just get involved later on at a later point. And I'll let Rachel talk a little about some of the um, sort of benefits of marketing your events during this time and what that looks like. Yeah, so um, another part of the event part, the event consumption and event execution is um, what was great about going virtual is that we could test out different times of the day as well. So like lunchtime and um, morning and evening because people didn't have to travel during the workday to get somewhere. So it really added that, that extra benefit. Um, and as far as marketing goes, kind of similarly, we were able to market a little less um, further out from a date, um, we were able to kind of market within a week and get great turnout to our events because especially in the beginning of, of when we were staying at home, um, especially at that beginning time, um, people were just kind of waiting for things to happen. I think they were looking for those connection points. Um, and, and it's just more convenient. You don't have to plan around it. You don't have to plan travel around and get, getting somewhere. So you can really kind of turn these things out and market them a little less far in advance, um, which was helpful for us as we were making this transition and still are. <laughs> Another piece of that beyond marketing your events is also how are you communicating day to day with your members? Um, so a huge game changer for Thai pros was um, introducing Slack. So we've had Slack um, for about three or four years now, um, which has um, saved and spared our inbox, our email <laughs> inbox, and allowed us to have communications um, in kind of one contained space. It also works really well for um, organizational knowledge management pieces as well, because you can share files, photos, um, and kind of keep everything organized in one space. Um, but this was a lifesaver whenever we moved into um, the pandemic era kind of virtual space because we already had over 300 people in our workspace who were already planning events um, who are already kind of working on initiatives and having conversations in this workspace um, we were already doing a lot of the remote piece so if you um, don't yet have slack i highly recommend it um, not only for your leadership team it might be a great tool but also for your members at large creating kind of a general uh, membership channel where people can talk about things that are interesting to them and then you can create um, specific channels for different in events initiatives um, or programming that you would like to get more feedback on so slack's been a great resource for us highly recommend it um, but if you're not interested in going into the slack uh, space then you can also um, use other tools like facebook groups um, so Facebook groups, again, are the space where people can basically just kind of virtually engage with one another um, and they can do that um, at, at any time, right? So you can post in these Facebook groups. Um, but I will say that it, um, from our experience, it takes a lot of curating to get these Facebook groups off the ground. Um, so to make sure that if you're in the space um, to get them launched, that you are constantly putting in um, engaging relevant content, um, making sure that you're posting conversation starters to make sure that people are actually engaging and not just kind of like liking and scrolling, <laughs> but to actually have people um, creating conversations in this workspace. Um, but that's also a really great tool. And of course, um, there's always like the most intimate and kind of personal touch way, which is text calls and emails to your members. Um, just checking in on them to see how they're doing, um, to see how the organization can continue to support them. Um, it's a really great, um, nice touch that definitely lets your members know that you um, are thinking about them and that you want them to remain engaged with your organization. So um, I did want to hit a little bit on um, resources and funding during this time. Um, 
as I've, as mentioned, Hype is different than Type Rose in that it is not um, a free organization. You, to participate in our events, typically you pay a subscription fee or you pay per event. Um, what we wanted to do in this time was build goodwill and also kind of gain more traction for Hype um, in our community. As mentioned, um, part of our strategic planning process, even prior to COVID was diversifying and um, inclusivity, building more people into our organization who represent a wide range of backgrounds and careers and all sorts of things. Um, so this was our opportunity to do that. Virtual events were are, are for us very low cost or no cost. Um, we had a great speakers who were willing to donate their time. Um, so we opened up our events, our virtual events, to the general um, young professional population. Um, and I think that was really helpful in just doing some more exposure. Um, for us, we are dealing with where do we go now. Um, so do we start to charge and kind of incentivize that in some way? But that's what we did as far as um, opening up our events and, and something you could consider if you want to. So now that we've kind of covered um, who your audiences, some tools for um, marketing, communicating, and um, some platforms for these events, we definitely want to dive into some of the topics that we think um, will be successful for young professionals to keep them engaged during this time. Um, so especially with the economy being what it is, young professionals, um, many of them are being furloughed, laid off, um, or just using this time right now to think about how their company is handling um, switching virtually and might be considering a career change or a company change. Um, so a lot of young professionals right now really are looking at opportunities for professional development and skilling themselves up um, to make themselves even more invaluable to the companies and organizations that they're working with. And um, so this is a great opportunity for professional organizations to be focused on professional and personal development um, ranging on topics from resume building, helping and professionals really develop and use LinkedIn um, as another uh, virtual tool for them to, to do job searching um, and other professional networking opportunities, whether that's B2B um, or creating um, groups for certain professions. So I'll let Rachel talk about some of the awesome work that Hype has been doing in the professional and personal development space. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about some specific things that we did um, in the past few months. Um, we, when um, the stay-at-home orders started, we had had a program planned already with a um, professor from the University of Richmond. Um, and I worked with him immediately to figure out how to reconfigure this program to really address the needs of what people were going through at the time. So um, the program was called Career Res Developing Your Career Resilience. Um, he was great and was able to do that for us twice and then did a follow-up program. So we got very lucky in that space and that was very popular. It really showed how important those programs were and are to people and really what people are desiring through um, participating in our organization. Um, also gave an opportunity for people to have their resume reviewed their resume reviewed one-on-one -on -one with someone. So as mentioned, my background is in career development. Um, so I was able to do some quick resumes, resume reviews. We called it a rapid resume review via Zoom. So they got 10 minutes with uh, me to look over it and give some feedback um, for free. And I think that was a really great service and opportunity for people who did get furloughed or may have been looking for a job and then COVID hit. Um, and we also did some networking opportunities as well, um, which were hit, hit and miss with participation, but still I think people appreciated those. Another programmatic topic that we're seeing uh, that there's a lot of appetite for right now is connection and community building, especially um, during quarantine. Uh, for those who don't feel quite comfortable um, being able to go out and meet in person again, um, connection is a huge piece. Um, social isolation is, is ramped up. We want to find ways to help our members um, stay connected with each other and also with the greater community. So some more fun, lighthearted events um, like social happy hours, personal networking opportunities, that's less B2B, less professional, but more just hanging out. Um, and then fun events such as cooking classes, trivia, arts and culture. Um, all of these are really um, important programmatic elements right now. Um, 
And especially being mindful for some of these fun events uh, that individuals' um, stamina on, on Zoom is, is not quite as high as their tolerance is for in-person events. So making sure that the events that you're creating um, have icebreakers, have games, have ways for people to really intentionally engage with each other and being mindful um, to maybe keep some of those, uh, especially if it's just social networking, um, to smaller time allotments. So not hosting two hour ones, um, but maybe keeping them a little bit shorter. Um, but some other like fun engaging events, Typers at the beginning hosted a virtual talent show where we allowed um, all of our members to showcase their uh, amazing talents. And then we had a, um, a gift card for a local restaurant um, for whoever the winner was that was based on like a fan favorite. Um, so finding these types of things, social happy hours are really great um, things that you can do virtually for like little to no cost. Um, that will keep people engaged. And I know Hype had some great events that they hosted recently as well. Yeah, well, the one we did um, that was really well done was we coordinated with a local nonprofit to do a cooking class. Um, and we had a chef from the Jefferson Hotel, which is our, I think, only four diamond hotel in the city. Um, and then we had someone from um, a distillery in town do a drink demo. So it was a great mix of people and networking. We did that on Facebook Live. Um, so that was something that people could engage in passively, as we mentioned, those passive programs that you can do. Um, that was an example of that that I think went really well um, and get, get, gave us the opportunity to network with a, an organization we hadn't really worked with before. Another huge one um, that we're seeing is that young people are really, really interested in helping support small businesses and nonprofits, um, whether or not they are the business owner themselves or they just want to see their favorite local restaurant or retailer um, succeed through the pandemic. Um, we're seeing a huge appetite for young people wanting to um, know how to support and connect with small businesses. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, a great opportunity is collaborating on events um, with other organizations, with other nonprofits, with other small businesses, um, reaching out and finding, especially the, the local um, businesses in your area, um, how you guys can get together and um, create programming um, that allows you to cross promote as well, but it creates new relationships that will last even beyond um, the pandemic. So that's a good time to reach out to other businesses and nonprofits. Um, another opportunity is to raise money through event registration. Um, so these can be, you know, fundraisers for other nonprofits um, or to support small businesses, um, especially utilizing small and minority owned businesses uh, for certain giveaways. Um, if you are doing a drawing or a prize for any sort of program that you're doing, uh, be mindful of where you're getting those gift cards from or where you're getting some of those um, prizes from um, and be intentional about supporting your small owned and minority owned businesses because that's what young people are really excited about right now. Mm -hmm. um, and again, cross promoting via social media um, when you have multiple organizations that are promoting events because they're all collaborating on it, on it together and that just broadens your audience and your reach. Um, and then there's also opportunities to reframe signature events and um, I'll let Rachel talk about what Hype is doing to reframe theirs. Yeah, um, we have a large event, a large award ceremony, um, typically in the spring, got moved to the fall and um, before COVID and now um, will be kind of closer to the winter time. Now we have decided to go totally virtual with this program. Um, it is our Young Professionals Award Ceremony. So again, going back to that whole idea of not being um, tone deaf, recognizing what our community and our country is going through right now, um, recognizing the resiliency that um, our community has had through their small businesses, through the work they've been doing individually. So we're really gonna utilize this opportunity, we're planning to um, utilize this opportunity to highlight, of, highlight um, small businesses in our area through putting our money where our mouth is, using them, um, paying them for their services, um, highlighting people who are doing amazing work. So we've changed our, our awards completely. Um, highlighting makers and artists in the Richmond region um, and people who've done social movements as well. So um, this is another great way to reframe, um, to hopefully bring a light to a really dark time. 
Um, and also just, yeah, be conscious of what's going on around us. And so um, our final recommendation, some programmatic elements that you can incorporate to engage young professionals during this time or find ways to empower young voices in the community. Um, we know that a lot of young professionals are essential workers um, or who might be going back into the workplace after working from home for several months. Um, creating programming around how to help young people advocate um, to make sure that their workplace um, is a safe and healthy environment, that they are receiving the PPE that they need, um, to make sure that the businesses and organizations and companies that they're working for are meeting their standard of um, what going back to work looks like. Um, and also having conversations about racial justice and organizations. Um, so this is two, twofold. Um, not only um, is it a good time for young professional organizations right now to reflect on um, issues of um, equity and racial justice within our own YP organizations, having our leadership team um, have conversations about what this looks like creating programming for the community about um, topics covering these issues, um, but also helping young professionals feel comfortable going into their workplaces and either joining diversity and inclusion task forces or creating their own to help their companies kind of combat some of the institutional um, racial injustice issues that we're seeing um, that are really being um, at the forefront of everyone's mind right now. Um, and finally, another way um, that young professional organizations can engage young people right now is to engage them as voters. So Thai Pros, um, certainly in the past, but right uh, in 2020, has created a campaign called 918 Vote. Our area code is 918. Um, and 918 Vote is focused on voter engagement for people under the age of 40. Um, so we know that we are a um, typically underrepresented group when it comes to voting at the polls. Um, so our entire um, purpose for this um, particular initiative is to register young voters, to educate young voters, and to get them out to the polls. So before the pandemic started, uh, our, for Super Tuesday, we had a early voting block party and a watch party. Um, since then, we've also transitioned to virtual candidate meet and greets um, so that young voters have a sense for who it is that they're voting on for on election day, and then creating an entire campaign um, around really um, encouraging people to get out and vote. We know that um, everything that's happening right now, we're seeing a huge upsurge in young people wanting to be civically engaged, um, and voting is absolutely one of those, um, those critical ways to help young people feel engaged and to feel ownership of the um, policies and the politicians that are in their community. So again, thinking about it from like the national and the global level, but also at the hyper local level, if you can engage young people um, in the voting space, that's also um, a really great way to keep young people engaged. A lot of young people are paying attention right now to these types of things. Yeah, this has really shown up in the survey that we've done. I, I mentioned we're still in the process, but we already have a lot of responses and a lot of the open-ended responses are talking about how do I get involved in my community? How can we talk about what's going on in the community? Um, how can we talk about politics in the community? We have a huge mayoral election coming up um, in, in November. So with everything that has happened in Richmond, um, with the protests, with uh, police brutality, with different things that have gone on, um, the mayor election is going to be a big deal. So um, I am going to, copy Andrea and do a lot of very similar things as we lead up to that because that will be our big election in our city and state um, to really engage those young voters and we're also thinking about that racial justice piece so we have some programming lined up um, that we're planning to unveil around um, getting people having those conversations feeling comfortable about having those conversations and also it really like I mentioned it really intersects with your professional life um, People don't see those as two separate things. They see them as one and the same, and they want their workplace to um, align with that. Um, COVID in the workplace, I'll also mention too, the a lot of, um, this is kind of related, but I have found that a lot of workplaces in our area are may not be allowing their employees to go to in-person events because of their work from home policy. So there are a couple of organizations that will be working home, working from home um, for a, quite a long time. Um, so we want to be aware of that as well. So that's why, um, at least particularly for us, where we're located, um, virtual events are going to be kind of what we're going to be doing for quite a while now. Um, and I think that is 
just something people are getting used to. And I just wanted to mention that too. I know that's different in everybody's region and how they're responding, um, but I'll just speak for Richmond and that's what we're doing. So with that, that's kind of our overview of ways to keep young people engaged um, right now in 2020 with everything going on. We hope that um, some of these tips, best practices, and learning opportunities that we've gone through are helpful for you as you engage young professionals within your community. Um, and with that, we would like to open the floor to any questions. Well, thank you very much, Andrea and Rachel, for that amazing presentation. I really appreciate it. We have questions coming through the chat. And this is a reminder, we will not be unmuting folks to verbally ask their question. Please send all questions through the chat and we will do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Um, one of the first ones that I have for both of you is would you be willing to share PDF versions of your surveys, both after your virtual event surveys and the surveys that you mentioned during your presentation with us today? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, yep. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So that means um, when we post this uh, webinar, you will be able to find those surveys below it um, on our events page and our ACC University page. Now, I have a really good question here from Heather. What has been both of your experiences with managing, with managing the varying age ranges of the individuals that particularly engage with these groups? Our challenge has been labeling our group anything with young. It seems to turn away those who want to engage as a mentor or who consider themselves to be on the cusp of not a young professional. Love that question, get yeah. that all the time. <laughs> um, so a lot of us say, uh, a lot of people come to us and say like, hi pros, what's the cutoff age? Um, our response to that is always young and young at heart. Um, so yes, we have <laughs> for our leadership team, but the way that we see it is that if you are engaged and passionate about any of the issues that young people also see um, as uh, particular interest points right now, like you are more than welcome to engage in our organization by showing up, by, um, by uh, being a mentor, by kind of whatever way it is that you want to engage with. Um, so it's interesting to see that um, as well, kind of the age range, especially because we're seeing um, the next generation kind of like sneak in uh, before we were all kind of this millennial block and now we're starting to see um, the next generation move in as well. So how do we engage everyone that's the full range from, you know, late 30s to just out of college, right? Um, and the answer to that is, I think that the opportunity exists um, when you're able to bring all the people together, um, particularly around topics that are kind of a little bit more broad, um, and then creating the space for it not to feel uncomfortable for people who are in their young 20s and their you know, mid to late 30s coming into the same space because they care about the same topic. Mm -hmm. So finding programmatic elements um, that are appealing to a broader range of individuals and then um, creating icebreakers opportunities for them to network to understand that there might be a 15 or even 20 uh, year age gap but if you care about the same things then that um, becomes less important. Yeah just to echo what um, Andrea is saying I think that um, coming into hype I, I recognize that there was a reputation through our community of it being really geared toward the single 20 something um, even though technically we go up to 40. Um, so I think you know, doing a, a few things really helped. Honestly, virtual helped with the accessibility. Um, I think especially we're talking about young professionals who have children. Um, so we don't want anyone to feel like this is not for them just because they have kids. Um, so we want to keep those people engaged because it brings value. Um, those people who are kind of at the tail end of being their young, a young professional and the people who just entered their career really need each other. So um, we want to offer a space where, like Andrew mentioned, that broad topic. Um, also thinking about things like, do we keep doing happy hours or do we think about other things that may be appealing for our broader audience? So um, I know Tallahassee has a really amazing program that's um, a coffee conversations opportunity to network. Um, that might be a little more accessible for people of broader ages or, or you know, doesn't exclude people. So we want to be 
inclusive in what we do. And I try not to make assumptions, I think, um, in who I'm marketing my, my events and programs to. Um, I think that's a big one is like coming from a space of like, okay, inclusivity means I'm not going to assume that these are all young, single 20 somethings. <laughs> Thank you both for sharing. Um, what has been the most successful time of day for your virtual events for both of you? I think for us, um, it's, it's been good to, to vary them because of that just, it, it includes more people. So I think typically evening will be more popular, but we've had great turnout or lunchtime events too. So, so I really just say, just vary them, offer different times if you can, so that you can hit those different markets of people. Like people with kids may be better off having that daytime meeting. Um, and some people really can't do pull away at daytime. So nighttime is better for them. So really varying has been the best. I would say the topic of the meeting mm -hmm. that event that you're having um, will make a difference. So especially if it's in the realm of professional development, doing it during the daytime is great because then people also don't feel guilty about maybe using an hour of their workday um, if it's professional development. But professional development in the evening may not um, be as exciting for people who are already drained and just want to kind of like unplug. Um, so I would say that uh, keeping your kind of like fun, lighthearted, um, kind of activities and events in the evening see uh, you'll see a bigger turnout and then keeping more of your professional development um type events during the day tends to work out pretty well thank you all right ashley asks i'm curious how you were able to keep your committees engaged during this time my committee really took a step back to focus on themselves thus we lost the momentum yeah, um, same. <laughs> um, honestly, the same. It became a challenge and it became something where we had to a pulse check with our leadership team in particular. We were doing one on one calls with each of them to see where they were at, um, what supports they needed, because we wanted them to focus on themselves first. Um, and then after a few weeks, um, it, we had more people who had a little more um, time and energy and could, got their feet under them and felt like they could be engaged. Um, one thing that we did um, is we had a leadership retreat um, a couple of weekends back, and that was a great time. We um, hadn't really had a, a large amount of time that we had all spent together since March. So seeing everybody um, kind of in that space and being able to strategize to kind of regroup, recenter, and refresh was really critical for our team. So if you haven't, um, if you haven't done a retreat or if you haven't scheduled one, Again, virtually be mindful of people's stamina and make sure that they're engaged and not like folding laundry uh, while they're in the middle of the retreat, <laughs> um, making sure that they stay engaged. Um, but having that reset button can help kind of get people back on track um, and help them stay re-engaged, especially for thinking about what the next six months or the next year um, look like for the organization. I would say retreat was a super helpful um, tool for us. Yeah, um, for us, I was lucky. I think I've just been lucky with having a phenomenal team um, on my side who really wanted to partner with me. I think that they all were like, oh, you're new. This sucks, <laughs> um, which is great. Definitely there were some people, there are people who took a step back and just really didn't show up um, as much, which is fair. And I definitely recognize why and why you would do that at this time. Um, but I really leaned on the people who were open and willing to participate. And, um, I think we had some consistent meetings happening too. That was really helpful, like check-ins and, um, like, Oh, we're just going to have a quick happy hour together. Um, so that is, that's helpful for us. We are planning to do a retreat and it will probably be a virtual half day, um, is the plan at the end of this month. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Roxy asks, I can't say ask today. I'm sorry about that. Um, besides Facebook Live, what software and programs are you using to do virtual events? Our members seem to be Zoomed out. Me too. 
We, that's Zoom is really what we've been using. And we are, I've heard some people I see on the chat that somebody have, has mentioned hop in and I know socio has come up. Um, so we are going to be exploring some of those other virtual event platforms, especially as we're entering into some of our larger scale events going to be happening. Um, and this is going to be a longer time than we expected. Um, so yeah, but primarily Zoom and um, Facebook Live, we haven't really used anything different. I don't know about you, Andrea. Yeah, same for the most part. Um, I would say in terms of, you know, people being zoomed out, um, where we've seen the most success where there's still been quite a bit of engagement is when it comes to planning or creating or doing things, people are less um, excited necessarily about showing up just to um, consume um, mm -hmm. content. Um, but in the evenings, we have people who are like, I'm super excited about this initiative. Let's get together and plan it. Um, so that's where we're seeing a lot of engagement where the Zoom piece of it doesn't seem to be so um, draining because you're actually engaging and not just kind of like watching a screen. Um, so that has been super helpful. Um, and another piece yeah. is thinking through ways that you can host remote, um, not just virtual, but like actual remote events. So I know that our sustainability crew right now is creating a campaign for like clogging and picking up trash. So mm -hmm. everyone can do that on their own time um, and then document it and then basically like have a competition to see like who's picked up the most trash. Um, so that's a way that people are staying engaged, but it's not like a, a virtual meeting where they have to be on Zoom. They're really just kind of like going back and forth and engaging with each other on social media and in the Slack workspace. And that's been fun. <laughs> yeah, we're thinking about some ideas um, around writing letters and emails to your uh, elected officials um, to like kind of encourage them to do, make take action on things that you may want them to. So um that can be an independent thing. I will also say just to this zoomed out um, comment, with the results that we've gotten so far from our survey, people aren't as zoomed out as I thought they would be. Um, I've only, out of 75 responses, I've only had, I think 10 people say they're done with virtual events. So I will say that I would maybe revisit that thought and get an idea if that's legitimate or if that was something more from the beginning of the stay at home order, because I think that was when it was exhausting. Um, but I think now that this has become a little more normal, people may feel a little bit different about it. So I would just challenge you to, to find out because um, I was surprised about that response too. Thank you for that. Um, and I will agree the most, um, what we've seen from our side is the smaller groups tend to be more engaged and more welcoming to Zoom rather than the bigger groups. So maybe keep that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is from Brittany. She says, since the beginning of our Young Professionals program, the staff person has done all the work. How would you recommend to transitioning to requiring the leadership team, volunteer leaders, to be more hands-on? Put it in your bylaws. <laughs> so we, I need those uh, bylaws. <laughs> yep, at Thai Pros, uh, whenever we bring on our leadership team, we have them sign a contract, um, like very clearly um, listing off the expectations that they are to be responsible for hosting one event a month. And they'll get staff support if they need support for, you know, creating an event bride or anything like that will support them. Um, but we absolutely leave it up to our leaders to create the programmatic, uh, the programming elements. Um, so I would say maybe like if we have like a reverse problem where I feel like, oh, this would be really cool to do. But if our leadership team isn't the one building it, um, then it kind of falls through. We just really put the emphasis on our leaders and the expectation that if you're joining our leadership team, then you are responsible for creating programming. Um, it also gives them a lot of ownership and they feel um, a lot, a, a sense of excitement of being able to kind of create the programs that they're passionate about and that they think are really interesting and then engaging other young people to um, share in that interest. Yeah, um, we're framed probably more so like the person asking the question where more of the work in the past, I think, has been on the staff member. Um, and I feel that, you know, pressure, um, but I have pushed myself, especially with a lot of the changes that we're making, especially with icons, the award ceremony, to put some of that onus back on them. Um, as someone who came from working with college students in student activities and residential life and that kind of thing, putting the onus back on volunteers can be beneficial because then they have stake in the game. Um, so I think setting those expectations from the beginning is like what Andrea is talking about is so key. Um, 
because I think people want to feel like they're contributing to something and actually seeing something come out of it. Um, but if the norm is that, well, we're, we kind of just show up to meetings and things happen, then, then that's what will continue to happen, I think. So um, I've been pushing myself to, and that's been hard to ask for help um, from my volunteers. It's not easy when that hasn't necessarily been the, the culture truly, I guess. Awesome. Thank you. So Andrea, I got a question for you. Will you be willing to share the contract for the leadership group with the group? Everyone's yes. going to be r and you, I know. Happily. I will happily share the contract. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then the best, the best question I see to complement that question is Alicia is currently in the early stages of restructuring the, her YP council. Do you have any recommendations on key things to consider? Yes, um, I think the big ones are role expectation um, of giving any sort of leadership person who's coming on clear defined um, expectations for what they need or what you need from them um, as they join your leadership team. Um, I've seen some um, some YP groups that are structured in terms of like skills based, like we need a treasurer, we need a communications person, or we need a this or a that. Um, and that can be really helpful. But again, kind of really spelling out what that might look like, thinking about what the needs of your organization are, um, especially from the leadership team, um, and, and going from there, whether or not you have a social chair, whether or not you have a, um, uh, in a, a your like big event chair, kind of whatever that looks like. Um, but then just being really clear to anyone who's joining your leadership team about what they can expect, the time commitment, um, and, and going from there. Um, I would say that that would be the biggest one. And also being mindful of uh, when you're creating your leadership team, who is actually making the decisions. And um, that's something that we've been going back and forth on of, um, is it the staff person that is making a lot of these decisions and then the leadership team is just um, kind of executing on those things or are the programmatic decisions being made by the leadership team and the staff person is just there to help support and make that happen. So just be mindful and thoughtful of what will work best for your current organization um, and go from there. Awesome. Rachel, do you have any comments to add? I'm going to be, we're probably going to be restructuring. Um, so, or thinking about a way to do that. So I am taking it all in. <laughs> <laughs> very wise, very wise. <laughs> all right. Our final question for today. And if we did not get to your question, we will be emailing you a follow-up answer. Um, so from Maya from Greater Binghamton. Sup, Maya? Um, I would love to know how you execute raising money through events. Are, are they more well received at smaller or big or a bigger signature event? I want to explore this as part of our registration process. So far we haven't monetized our virtual events. So that is something like I mentioned that we're trying to figure out where we're going to transition into that. Um, that's all. I don't know. I, I'd love to hear because that's something that I would love to know as well. Um, what people are feeling about or how they're doing with that. What about you, Andrea? Are you doing any of that? Yeah. Um, so one event that we have coming up that is one of the few events that we charge for throughout the year is called our all access, which is our vertical networking opportunity. We bring in the CEOs from our city and have like a small kind of intimate um, round table speed dating session essentially with our CEOs. Um, so this year that's going to be virtual, um, but we would still like to have um, a, um, a, a charge for it. Um, however, the charge is going to be going to um, our Thai Pros Foundation, which is a separate um, a separate entity from Thai Pros um, that allows us to give out grants to cool projects that are happening in our city. Um, so with that, um, what we're doing and thinking about is um, what is the caliber of event, right? Is it something that people are like excited about paying for? And we're being really mindful that we're only charging for events um, that you would normally, uh, that someone would normally pay for when it's not a pandemic and also being mindful of accessibility, being mindful of not keeping the price too high. Um, 
And then the same thing for our signature event, it's called the Boomtown Awards that we have at the end of the year. Um, same thing, keeping the price at a reasonable amount. Um, and then all that money is going to, um, to our foundation. So it looks a little different. I wouldn't, I, we have not been charging and probably will not charge for our virtual events just because there's very little cost associated with it. But for some of the larger events and those that are providing the most value, um, using that to bring in a little bit more revenue and also to make sure that there's skin in the game. I mean, we found over and over again that um, if someone pays a little bit of money, they're more likely to show up. And so all of your energies and efforts are not going to waste by hosting free events. Um, and so that's, that's one thing to think about as well. Are you doing it to raise money? Or are you doing it to make sure people show up? Um, and if you're charging really what is the value and maybe poll people and see what would you be willing to pay for an event like this um, and then get a sense for if people uh, are willing to pay or not in that way you can you can market it based on the, the demand and the need yeah I hope that answered your question Awesome. Well, it looks like we are at time. I cannot thank you both enough for sharing the awesome things you are both doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please give every, everyone, please give them a virtual round of applause because they're both awesome in their own right. Emily, so, I think um, one thing, I think it would be awesome if we could follow up with a, we've done a couple of round tables that I know have been really helpful. Um, if, if this is something that people wanted to kind of keep the conversation going, um, I think a round table to follow this up could be really cool because we've done them. So yeah, if you join that Facebook group, that'd be a great way. Well, I want to learn from everyone else is really what I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are beating me to it. Awesome. So thank you everyone for participating and thank you, Andrea and Rachel. Again, I cannot thank you enough. As a reminder, this, discussion, this webinar will be posted on our events division and our ACCE University webpage by tomorrow, Ju July 9th. And also keep an eye out for an email from me next Monday. We are starting up our Young Professionals quarterly roundtable discussions starting in August. We are currently in the process of formulating who that email list is and a roster for participation. Um, and until the call in August, please continue to collaborate with your peers via our Facebook groups that I just posted. We have an events division Facebook group and a young professionals Facebook group, depending on what you feel best um, fits, your fits your role and what you're doing at your chamber. Um, our next events webinar is our 60 sponsorship ideas in 60 minutes on July 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I cannot wait to see you there. It's going to be incredible. There are prizes and you always walk away with great ideas for your next sponsorship. So that is it for today. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. <laughs>